Welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Dr. David Morehouse. We're going to talk a little bit today about the history of the remote viewing program, and we're going to also go back to David's experiences in the special access program he he worked on in the uh, 80s and and 90s, Uh, and we'll kind of continue from where we left off in the last episode. So, uh, David, in terms of the history of the remote viewing program, even long before your time, how did this all come about? Uh, That's a really good question. And I will tell you this, that there are, my my view of the history of this program uh, is a a view and an understanding of it, uh, not because I went through it, uh, because I joined in what, Eighty late 86, 87, and I was there 87, 88, 89, and left in 90 to go to another special access program uh, before going to Commander General Staff College. So <clears throat> there are far better historians of the program than I might be, uh, but I don't withhold anything that I do know, which others may to protect certain things. I can say that I know this from either the historical files or from, you know, my experience being there. And I'm not, you know, cobbling any of it together in terms of, let me see what sounds good. It's just what I know or what I've been told or, or, or what I experienced myself. <clears throat> there are books by former colleagues like Paul Smith and maybe Joe McMonigle, but I think prob- probably Paul Smith is probably the best historian of it. And I would say that because he was there the longest. I think Mm -hmm. Paul was there like 15 years of an army career as a military intelligence officer. So, and I get it, you know, I I mean, I understand why he did. Uh, And and to, and to, to defend his decision to do, I just want to say this, I know it's kind of off topic, but I want people to know that I have a lot of respect for the guy. <clears throat> We're not friends, but I have a lot of respect for him and a really a great appreciation for them as a father uh, and as a, a military officer who served in the capacity that he did. Uh, his wife, this is common knowledge, but his first wife left him. He had, I think, three children. Uh, and now he became a single father who was also an army officer. That's, that has to be a tough, you know, that has to be a tough road to walk. Uh, I know that he was very diligent about, you know, he got him up every morning, got him cold, got him bed, got him off the school. He came over to the remote viewing unit uh, and then he, you know, got ready and went off to the Defense Intelligence College working on a master's degree <clears throat> and then came back again, you know, was was typically there for lunch. And the kids came home if they came home for lunch. And he was certainly there every night when the kids came home from school. And uh, he was still, he's an accomplished artist. He paints uh, like the kinds of stuff Ingo Swan did, but much more you know, cosmic artist. That's what he refers to himself as. Uh, he's also a musician. Uh, and he was a good, he was a fine remote viewer. Uh, he really was. And I, I looked at everything he did that was done while I was there anyway and before. Uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he was very upset that I wrote Psychic Warrior. Uh, I think I was told by Lynn Buchanan, the very first words out of his mouth were, I wanted to write that book, meaning what he wanted to do was be the first guy to, you know, expose it. But I know that he wouldn't have exposed it because he wouldn't have done that because he was an active duty army officer, but he had a family to take care of, as did I. But he just wasn't going to cross that line. He was an intel officer. You know what I mean? Uh, And I know that when he got out, he's still protecting Clarence. Uh, I'm sure that he's still protecting clearance. So there are certain things that guys are doing that protecting clearances and associations with CIA or DIA won't tell you and won't do. But he wrote in uh, Seeing into the Mind of My Enemy, which I read. Uh, He did a very definitive history. But then somebody else like Dale Graff will come along and write their definitive version of the history. Uh, You know, there, there were other, there were people that fell out of the woodwork that I had had no idea if they actually ever were in the program. Certainly the name was never mentioned while I was there. Uh, but 
suddenly there's a book out and they're claiming to have been part of the remote viewing program. <clears throat> I know that uh, Joe McMonigle and Skip Outwater were there. Uh, Joe McMonigle was a remote viewer. Skip Outwater was an operations officer, who certainly still you know, understood and trained in remote viewing, but uh, not necessarily considered or used as a remote viewing, a remote viewer. Uh, and uh, I also know that in the training of the remote viewers, that there were different levels that they were trained at. <clears throat> like Paul Smith recently admitted to a, someone asking the question that he had only been trained up to stage three of a six stage protocol by Ingo Swan. Now I know that Ed Dames was trained by Ingo Swan as well. And I know he was trained in all six stages. I don't know where Lynn Buchanan, who, who trained Lynn Buchanan. I don't think it was Ingo Swan. And I don't know tr who trained Gabrielle Pettengill. I don't know. But she trained me all the way to stage six. And I know that Angela and Robin in the unit were trained in coordinated remote viewing up to stage six and then opted to do something different. And Mel Riley went all the way to stage six because you saw some of his sketches, right? Mm -hmm. The complex quality you know, sketches that are called geospatial sketches, dimensional sketches. <clears throat> so there are many other people that were in that unit much, much longer than I who have a better sense of the history of that unit, and I'm okay with that. But for me, how I understood it was that circa 72, 73, uh, it, the CIA became aware of because they're always looking and feeling to see who's doing what. And evidence was presented that the Soviets and the Chinese were heavily involved in the study of clairvoyance or you know, ESP or paranormal phenomena, those kinds of things. <clears throat> and they're only interested in it because the intel, if you understand how intel, how intelligence pictures are created, you must think of it like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no intelligence collection methodology that is 100% accurate, none. Because why all of them fall to human interpretation, even signals intelligence or electronic intelligence or satellite, you know, photo intelligence or especially human intelligence or anything else, there are all weaknesses and flaws in that process through the interpretation. And now I think there used to be like the top, there was like this, five that were like the standard five Intel collection pro methodologies that were used. And now because of all of the technology that's there, I think I recently read there's upwards of 32 Intel collection met methodologies. That means that's 32 providers of pieces of the puzzle. <clears throat> all of them with varying degrees of accuracy and timeliness. Mm -hmm. And it is the analyst's position to pull all that together and try to assemble the puzzle into an actionable picture. Uh, often not very easy to do and often very time consuming. So when the, the director of the CIA uh, found that, was told or briefed that these were these things were going on in Russia and in China, uh, the, act, the question back to Robert Gottlieb was, are we doing it? <clears throat> and Robert Gottlieb said, no, we're not. And so the decision was made then, then we need to, we need to get busy doing this. Uh, and there was Senate support from the Senate Select, Senate Select Committee uh, for Intelligence. Uh, and so they put out a, a contract, a request for proposals. I don't know who all submitted proposals, <clears throat> uh, but I do know that the proposal was awarded, uh, the contract was awarded as a sole source contract. That's a very difficult kind of contract to get as a contractor. Uh, to get a sole source contract meant that the interpretation made by the Central Intelligence Agency that was overseeing this determined that SRI International, with TARG and put off at all, all the rest of the engineers and scientists and, you know, physicists and whatever else were there, psychologists, that uh, they proposed to do the job in such a way that nobody else could, could capture that. 
And so a 20 year sole source contract, I'm sure it was a standard one year base, one base year and you know, four option years, but they did it for over 20 years. They had this contract, sole source. So it, they always toss around this figure of $20 million. When in the world have you ever heard of the US government only spending $20 million? What, SRI was doing this work for a million dollars a year? Come on, right? Yeah, so, it'd be more expensive, like much more expensive than that. So, of course. I mean, <clears throat> they were pulling in uh, natural gifted psychics, guys like Yuri Geller. They even interviewed Tony Robbins. Uh, he stands up and st on stage and tells people. Why? Because they were looking at human performance factors. They were looking, right? So he's a big human performance guy, transpersonal psychology guy. They were pulling in anybody and everybody to pick their brain, you know, ask questions, see what they could offer. If there was something they could offer long term, okay, good, stay. If not, dismiss, next. Uh, and Ingo Swan, of course, was came into this. If you want to read and, and wade through uh, Ingo Swan's book called Remote Viewing, The, the Real Story, uh, you know, jump on it. It's online somewhere. Uh, you won't even have to buy it. But if you read it, it will be very much an indication of Ingo Swan's personality, which was quite eclectic and quite centered around Ingo. And I, I really loved the man, right? I did. I thought he was phenomenal in what he was capable of doing. So here was what happened in this contract. This is distilling down the contract into basically three deliverables. Of course, there were more, but these are the important ones. First one, <clears throat> can you tell us and prove whether or not human beings can actually do this thing, ESP, you know, see something distant in space and time and collect and talk about it and blah, blah, blah. Is that a human ability that you can experimentally, scientifically measure and evaluate and prove and substantiate for us? Second question or second deliverable was, can you tell us who will be good at this so we can know how to get them and bring them into this program and develop the program? Third question was, can you duplicate this? Now, duplicating means can you develop a training protocol? So that as we select these people, we can train them to do this particular thing. I will shorten this part of the story quickly by saying, <clears throat> Targ put off et al. at SRI are not educators, and they certainly are not military trainers. So to ask them as theoretical physicists or laser physicists and all the rest of them, right, to develop a program of instruction to train people how to do this, well, you might have as well have asked him to go find the lost art, <laughs> something like mm -hmm. that. They wanted to be to do it, and they wanted to give it an attempt, but they were not good at it. They're in, they're they're physicists. They're not military trainers. She so can't blame them. You can the only thing you could do is blame them for fighting you for that over over that. Ingo Swan was the guy they fought. Now Ingo, in writing that I have seen, has never has never actually ad admitted that animosity or friction between him and uh, mostly Targ. But he did admit it to me multiple times in telling his stories uh, at his home in the Bowery in New York that he said, and I quote, I wanted to hit Russell Targ in the head with a hammer every day. <laughs> and it was over a training protocol because uh, Dr. Targ had a vision for the protocol, which was much more relaxed and just kind of easy going like the Pat Price or like the Joe McMonigle interviews that you saw where it was monitor driven. And then the viewer just sat there and, you know, whatever altered state they could get in and, you know, talked about what they were seeing. And Ingo was no, 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 no. It has to follow a protocol that we can measure what they're doing and direct and guide them without us telling them what to do and, and following the guidance given uh, by the, auditors it could not be grid mercator it could not be cartesian it can't be that long coordinates has to be the, the numbers randomly assigned to the concept of the target ingo put all of that stuff together and uh, he put in which i am so amazed that a, a bowery artist right would understand this mechanism right it has to have feedback 
you have to feed back to the conscious mind and say you did that you did this well or you did this not so well and so it can correct and the repetition process etc so that came later down the road but by they started in 1973 now they were starting right at the time when all these things you know vietnam war went winding down troops coming out uh, the you know the United States kind of in turmoil internally, and at the same time, you know, looking around at how are we going to redesign the military? Uh, you have this thing. It was once called, and I heard the term, the golden sphere concept, which was to be this advanced human performance potentials, which is where the first Earth Battalion, the Task Force Delta think tank came in. You had Boyd, uh, Colonel Boyd, coming in with the Boyd cycle. Uh, which most people may not know what that is. The Boyd cycle was you had a you had a uh, an Air Force fighter pilot who flew in Vietnam and in Korea and was never he never lost an air to air engagement. He never lost a simulated air to air engagement. No matter what they did to change the variables, he never lost those engagements. Of course, the Air Force wanted to know why. Uh, I'll, prayerf- I'll distill down what, what Colonel Boyd said uh, when he was Major Boyd. He said that I can see what my enemy is going to do before my enemy does it. And therefore, I position my aircraft, and he flies right into my gun target line. And this happens in microseconds, right? At the sp- Flying as they're flying. And so the Boyd cycle was developed. Observe, orient, decide, and act, which became the Oda loop, right? And now if you, if you Google that, there's probably 250,000 versions of that out there. But it began with this Air Force fighter pilot saying, in my mind, I observe, I orient my, my craft and self, I make a decision, pull trigger, not it, more complexities, right? And, right, act, observe, orient, decide, and act. And the theory then became to be developed in that concept is this is a tool used in sales. It's a u- t- tool used in human communication. This is the first time it's been quantified. But theoretically, and in every example I've ever seen, if you can, if you can spend your Boyd cycle faster than your opponent in a negotiation, in a briefing, in a sales, in the air flying or on the ground, you will win every time, all things being equal in the, in the engagement. If you can spin your cycle faster than the other person, you win. These were phenomenal you know, breakthroughs in human performance that were showing up, right? So the idea that the CIA now turns around and goes, oh, let's figure out about you know, psychic phenomena, clairvoyance, you know, clairaudience, clairsentience. Uh, let's figure that out. Can, we, can humans really do that? So I think one of the very powerful things that came out of the CSRI, you know, experimentation was they very confidently came back to the CIA within a couple of years, three years maybe, and said, yeah, it, it, we can absolutely scientifically validate and assure you that human beings have this ability. Now, the next question was, can you tell us who would be good at it? Mm-hmm. This is a powerful answer. Russell Targus said it many times in his lectures. He said that the deliver what they said to the CIA was, yeah, we can tell you we'll be good at this. We believe that this is an ability inherent to every human being and that all that is required is for that human being to be willing to explore this. You know, setting aside all the judgments of, anything else. And if you have that willingness that you can realize this because it's an inherent ability in every human being, that means we are born with this. Uh, So why does it stop? You know, why isn't it there? Well, if you go to, you know, Scandinavian pediatric psychologists, uh, starting even before then, that were exploring intuition in children, adolescents, et cetera, uh, they substantiate in, in all of their peer-reviewed research. And now, you know, there's that same thing in North America, targeting the same question. You know, what is this intuitive capability in children? 
you know, what is it? Where does it come from? Why is it there? What do the kids say about it? And it's really interesting reading. At this point, there are hundreds of peer, if not thousands of peer-reviewed uh, publications, research studies on this. And it powerfully establishes the fact that we don't know how it's there or why it's there, but they come into this existence as soon as they are able to articulate it, objectify it. Uh, they talk about having known where they came from, know why they're here, uh, you know, know what their purpose is, et cetera, et cetera, in their language, in their words. These are powerful indicators that we're born into this existence with, with this ability. And <clears throat> where and why does this ability not develop in this? Uh, that's another well, question, but uh, and I have an answer for it, but not in well, this. Just, just, just to stop you right there, um, around what age are these children, when they're old enough to be able to articulate what their purpose is, but still young enough to still have that connection to wherever they came from? Yeah, it, the age, I mean, where they discover, I mean, where they're able to, the investigators are able to, uh, you know, uh, acquire data is when the child is old enough to be able to speak, right? They have to be able to articulate what, understand the question and articulate an answer. Or uh, maybe if they don't fully understand the question, you know, the lower they go on the age scale, they may not fully understand the question. And maybe they have to structure the question in more simplistic terms. I'm, I'm not real sure. But the idea is that as soon as they can get some, a child that can actually articulate you know, what their experience was, what their memories are, what their feelings are, that's when they start recognizing this ability. When does it go away is, is another piece of that question. Mm -hmm. It goes away when the, the, the institutional processing of children by the legions of the status quo begin to eliminate, right? It's sort of a, a, another example of like, it's not Darwinian pruning. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's opinion pruning. Like and socialization. So, yeah, exactly. Better word. Uh, or institutional institutionalization is probably better. Yeah. Uh, they're told that that's all folly, that it's not real, that it, it cannot be. It's like, you know, stop saying that, it, you know, et cetera. So you get peer pressure. You get uh, early on academic pressure. You even get theological pressure. Uh, and you get parental pressure that shunts this, that shuts it down. Now, in many cases, there are, you know, you have parents that are nurturing and developing and, you know, wanting that to come because they too know it or they believe it strongly. And so they nurture it and bring it up. Uh, parts that are missing in that equation, there really is no manual for doing that. But there, if you look around now, there's a whole bunch of resources that are out there for you know, training children and their intuitive powers to keep going and keep going and keep going. I have uh, students of mine uh, that are doing some amazing things with children. I mean, just amazing stuff with kids. They're just like, because I said to do this, they're collecting this stuff from all over the, the everywhere they can find it. And then they're, 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 pre they're building their children with this knowledge, this understanding of this power that they are born with, this ability. The, one of the things that has to be part of the of the training process of children now is you have to train them where the limits are in terms of who you can share this with, right? Because one of the great dampenings of this thing is peer pressure. You want to you want to be part of that your group, your peer group as a high school kid or as a junior high school kid or below, and you start talking about this ability that your parents are working on with you, you know what's going to happen, right? Uh, they're going to disengage because they want to be popular. That's more important. Uh, they might try to re-realize it again later in life, as many people do. Uh, I hear that story often. But the point is that part of the training process to, is to make sure that the children understand that there are influences outside and around them, outside of the home, that will not support them talking about that. And they will ridicule them. They need to understand that there is a line, there's a limit where you can't talk about that here. You can talk about it here, but you can't talk about it here. <clears throat> My perspective on the whole thing with, it, with the youth is 
that if we were born with this, with this ability, which Russell Target, SRI International said we were, then how did we get here with that ability? And why were we given that ability? And why and what was the catalyst that started the process of making sure that we didn't speak that language or realize that ability? I have my own long-term theories on all of that, uh, but that's not what we're talking about here right well, now. Well, no, I, I mean, if, <laughs> if you could succinctly categorize that, I, I mean, I, I think it's definitely within the realm. If there was one of the, you know, as soon as organized religion, as soon as organized religion began to structure itself and establish its footing and its power, it was there for one reason, and it was to control masses, to... Mm -hmm right? To allegedly bring order and peace and stability and those kinds of things. But we all know that that has never been, uh, you know, what religion ultimately does. Uh, it may do good things on some levels, but it is also the cause of great wars and conflict and massive death, etc. It is also one of the things that has caused taking just a simple human being born with this ability born with this ability to be capable of seeing, understanding, feeling, hearing beyond the physical, beyond the physical, that they are connected to something beyond the physical, always have been and always will be. But that jeopardized the principal tenets of organized religion. You cannot stand up in any way and say that you are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, because that destroys the organized religion, right? Those are all words used for if you follow the tenets of our belief structure mm -hmm. and do so unquestionably and do whatever we ask you to do on a basis of faith, sight unseen, that you will then maybe, you will be these things after you die. But what we know is that we are born as those things. And that is a weird concept for organized religion to have to face. I don't know if that came in the very beginning when people started to see this developing in children and others. Uh, it certainly would make sense, right? That you start to see that and you start to see maybe warriors who are spinning a Boyd cycle faster because they're connected. You maybe see something else. It doesn't mean that because we have that ability that everybody's good and, and there is no evil. Certainly those both elements are there and everything in between. So I don't know what the motivation was for the creation of these organized religion. I will tell you my belief structure is that it wasn't God. I mean, God didn't come down here and say, form this church and form that church. And by the way, it's okay if that one spins off and becomes something slightly different. Uh, I stopped believing that a long time ago. But what I do believe is that something placed us here. I mean, we were here. We did not rise up out of primordial ooze. That I can tell you as a scientist, that, that didn't happen. If it happened, they would be recreating that in primordial ooze, right? They would be creating chemically, uh, biologically that and seeing what they could raise up out of there. Uh, and they can't, and they won't. And they can't replicate that experiment. It's just a, it's just a statement. I, I think they're able to, to I think, produce protonoids or something like that, but that's about as far as they were able to get I think it was like uh, uh, Yelf. I can't remember. But it, single cell, anyway, single cell life or proteins or something else. Yeah, uh, but not creating anything that even comes close to sprouting legs and coming up out of the you know. Yeah, the, going from very, something very basic to extreme complexity is entropy works in the opposite direction. Exactly. Uh, so. I, that's how I understand that. I mean, I, I realize that just kind of the legions of the status quo in that, in that, I mean, religion has been probably one of the dominant forces in trying to tamp this down in humanity and saying, it's not you. You can't do that. Don't talk like that. Uh, you know, it, then it becomes, it's blasphemy, sacrilegious. You can't say those things. And I know having been a high priest in the Mormon church, I know that people do that. I've seen it. I've heard it. Uh, one of my last times that I ever stood at the pulpit of the, of the church, uh, I was asked to stand up as a high priest and talk about, I 
I think it was the law of tithing or something else. And I stood up and I talked about the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies that I talked about earlier about the, you know, a portal opening and that kind of stuff. And I could feel the, the uh, state president who was behind me uh, kicking me in the ankle. He was like slouching down in his chair, kicking me in the ankle, meaning stop, stop talking about that. And I just kept talking about it. And I gave my whole presentation of like 40 minutes with my ankle being kicked by this guy behind me. And when it was over, uh, and in the Mormon church, you finish every le lecture or sermon like that as with amen, uh, you know, and the, the amens that came back were mixed. <laughs> so, uh, when, and afterwards when I went down, because I just was not going to, I was not going to engage in religious pablum anymore. This wasn't mm -hmm. going to do it. I was not, I, I was in it long enough that I realized that the message being given was this really dumbed down message designed to feed the masses, you know, enough pablum each Sunday to get them to the next Sunday. It was the same message over and over, hitting on the same things. All the Sunday school manuals, all everything were always the same thing, right? The same message be, just being repeated. Year after year after year that was just restructured, turned around. This taken from the back, put up in the front, back and forth. And I was analytical enough to look at that and then be very displeased with that and understand it was a tool. It was a tool being used to do something and it wasn't a tool being used to inspire, uplift, you know, and allow people to become or realize you know, what their purpose is in this life, what their calling is in this life, which is the thing you do to honor your purpose, you know, or, or what, or what the, you know, what they were going to use as a lens to define them. Some people call that a primary question. And so many people don't know what that is. And often the primary question is a very limiting thing that people come up with. I can tell you what mine was coming up to school. My, when I was a young man, uh, when I when it, they discovered I was grossly dyslexic in the second grade, after I'd been called retarded by a second grade teacher because I couldn't read, we had just come back from Germany, and I'm standing in this place, and yeah, I couldn't I couldn't read. I, I didn't know what how to what it meant. It just looked like gibberish to me. This teacher made sure I got laughed at and called retarded, and then I had to get tested for intelligence, and they concluded that that was completely ass backwards, and so my father bless his heart, man. My father basically like flipped them all off and took me to Lawrence Livermore Air Force Base, where there was a, a young Air Force major there, a psychologist who was uh, becoming one of the experts, preeminent experts in dyslexia and defining it and finding solutions around it. I was in there as a young second grade kid around airmen that were there that had been determined to be dyslexic. So they're in the Air Force, but they did not read well and they were doing this stuff. So I was in and out of that for about two years and I learned how to read. I learned, you know, kind of a photographic process for being a rapid recognition dyslexic person. It wasn't called that back then. A rapid recognition dyslexia. And I also found that I had a, uh, I had an audio dyslexia which means that you people can say things to you and you don't hear exactly what they said. You hear something different. And uh, I learned very quickly, you know, moving up through higher education and things, I don't raise my hand if somebody asks a question. If a professor asks a question, my hand doesn't go up because I'm sure I'm unsure that I actually heard the question correctly. So I have to let somebody else answer the question and then piece it together that, oh, that was the question. And now the, there's the answer. Uh, you learn those tricks as you move through life uh, with that, with that uh, inability to read and you know, hear perfectly like other people do. It's not difficult in the military because most of what we hear in the military is what? The same thing, right? right. There are a few variations in it. And when there are variations, there's always somebody to ask or there are briefbacks, right? Uh, that, that can happen. Uh, it just didn't ever seem to be a problem there. So <clears throat> that is why I, my personal opinion as to why this ability was shunted and closed down because it didn't meet the objective of certain things. Otherwise, why would it have been shut down, stripped away? Why would we not want 
the youth of this planet to recognize that ability. If they did, how different might this world be, this global society? I mean, I, I'm not trying to be philosophical about that, but how different would it be if ability, if an ability, abilities, that physicist at SRI de determined we are born with, and that all of these pediatric psychiatrists and psychologists have determined as well that there is something that we are born with that gives us a knowledge of beyond the physical. So uh, that was a powerful statement that came out of SRI, and I'm really grateful to Russell Targ for having said that on multiple occasions. Uh, the third question I already addressed, they, they were not going to be able to develop a training program. Uh, as this all progressed and all these different things were happening, long about circa 79, INSCOM was exploring all of these other things. And I think that there was at one point, that, I'm not even going to talk about some of the early places where the, the remote viewing program ended up. I think it was in the Pentagon once and uh, they got tossed out for some reason. And in, INSCOM took it in under its wing. Uh, INSCOM was first over by Arlington and then relocated to another place. Uh, I already said that you have Thompson, three-star general, and you had Bert Stubblebine enamored of this whole idea. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when uh, Joe McLonigle go to the Monroe Institute. <clears throat> and eventually, I think as Joe McLon McMonigle retired, he fell in love with Robert Monroe's daughter and married Robert Monroe's daughter. So now Joe McMonigle becomes an integral piece of the, of the, of the uh, gateway uh, program, the Monroe Institute, as it was called back in those days. And so does Skip Atwater. He brings Skip Atwater, his buddy there, and they work now at the Monroe Institute. There was a discussion and there's a, there's a piece of a document that's been released that shows that uh, U.S. Army Operational Group, at the, which was the remote viewing program, uh, yeah. that they did it, you know, they were asked to do this analysis of Gateway and people kind of sort of half read stuff like that. And they, they jump on it like, oh, the Gateway program was part of the remote viewing program. No, it was not. Uh, the Gateway program and Robert Monroe's purpose, his intended purpose, stated purpose, was to use hemisync to invoke an out-of-body state. That's mm -hmm. what he was after. He used uh, you know, sensory deprivation boxes, not tanks, uh, all kinds of things. And, and, it, and it was a guided meditation, yogic kind of thing that walked you through these processes to try to get you to separate, to try to get you to have that experience. So it was experiential based. It was not remote viewing. And remote viewing is not that. Uh, so there, this, this uh, uh, June 1983 document gets out into the public as part of this CIA thing. And a lot of people have looked at that and gone, oh my God, well, that, you know, that's the same thing. They're the same thing. And they are not. And that document clearly states that. That document is done by the operations officer at the time, who simply, uh, you know, there's some MI lieutenant, you know, commander who is a lieutenant colonel. But what he does is he does a regurgitation of, of all these different, right? pulling from all these different books that have been written about psychic phenomena and, you know, astral projection and those things and puts that down there and sends it to the IMSCOM commander, Bert Stubblebein. There had, you know, there was some push to try to get, I mean, if you were at the Monroe Institute, you would have loved to have had, right, a government contract to start funneling people into there, you know, and pulling them out to, and then say they're remote viewers, but the, the writing was on the wall. That's not what it was. And they, they, Stubblebine was very clear from that memorandum that this is not what I'm looking for. And so a few people had been trickling in out of the INSCOM, many of them exaggerating what they did and how they got there. And I mean, mm -hmm. flat out lying about it. Uh, like claiming that they were pulled back from Japan because Bert Stubblebein knew that they were, you know, had psychic abilities. It's like, are you kidding me? But people like, well, listen to that stuff. It's like, that is nuts. You think of some two-star generals, you know, running no. through personnel files going, oh, you know, 
bring him back, you know, put him in the gateway program. And those individuals, I've heard them on podcasts and people ask them the question. I love this one. One guy says, and he was a signal intercept guy in Vietnam and uh, uh, claims to have been, have gone to the gateway program, but claims that General Stubblebine, a two-star general brought him back as a E6 or something and brought him back and pushed him into this program. And, and he came out and he said, he said to the interviewer, he goes, well, until I heard, until I heard the, the, the term remote viewing, I didn't know I was a remote viewer. <laughs> so it was like, as soon as you heard remote viewing, you real that connected the dots and you realized you're a remote viewer. And he continued that statement with, and I was, you know, I, I, I must have been working in the remote viewing program because you went to the gateway program. No, no, no. Even if that were true, that, that would not be, the outcome would not be true. So uh, that was going on. Uh, there were pro there the gateway program did submit put a lot of material paid for by the government into the inscom programs mm -hmm. and these were most of it was subliminal learning uh tapes i used to have the full set of the subliminal R russian learning tapes i mean i listened to them all repeatedly uh for a while uh, did it work i i, I couldn't order a I couldn't order a cheese sandwich in Russian. <laughs> I couldn't ask for the bathroom, you know? Uh, so it, no, it did not work for me, but maybe that's just me. Uh, but at, during this time in the seventies, 73, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up into the eighties, as long as Stubblevine was there and Thompson was still there, uh, you could go on Inscom and you would see young soldiers walking around with Sony Walkmans on their head. Uh, and they were listening to hemiseq tapes. They were listening to tapes that were supposed to improve performance, mental focus, productivity, uh, you name it. There was the cat napper. That was a great one. I loved that as an infantryman. I really wished I had it in the Ranger Battalion. Uh, the cat napper, you were supposed to listen to, in 30 minutes, you were supposed to get four hours of REM sleep. Uh, and there was a sound sleeper that in four hours, you would get eight hours of REM sleep. Now, I doubt very seriously they ever had the technology to actually test that. But I will tell you, I used it. When those tapes were there, I used them. I just griped and bitched the fact that I didn't have them back when I really needed them, you know, when we're living on two hours of sleep a night. <clears throat> uh, so all that stuff was there because INSCOM commander Stubblebine was supportive of it. It ultimately ended up costing him his career and his reputation and cost him mm -hmm. a uh, because he was so supportive of it. So when the remote viewing program kind of spun out of there, and I don't know when it did, uh, Stumblebine was unloading it. And I can tell you that I have seen all of the, you know, the congressional members that were all briefed on the program, and it had absolute congressional support. Absolute, right? And senators on the Senate Select Committee for Counterintelligence. I read you, uh, you know, I read you that quote from one of the Democrat from North Carolina. People supported this. People did not look at it with a cocked eye. People did not, you know, doubt it. Why? It had been developed in science. It had been developed scientifically. It had been proven by physicists who were award-winning, you know, laser physicists. They proved it scientifically. So what are you going to do to dispute it? Well, it. It wasn't really disputed, not ever effectively. There were never guys that, you know, that came in that attacked, attacked it. There were people that quibbled over it, but these were people that just quibbled over it because that was their that that's what they did for a living. Quibble over things like that. But they couldn't uh they could not they couldn't dispute it scientifically and prove it not to be. There was some English guy or some New Zealand guy that quibbled over this or quibbled over that, but let me tell you where that comes from, because I learned this back in the <clears throat> back in the 80s about things that went on in the 70s. Somewhere during the time frame when CNN was fairly new, they did a poll, and this poll had 3,000 respondents. I read this on an airline magazine. That's where I found this out. 3,000 respondents, and there were two questions asked. The first question of the 3,000 was, 
How many of you believe that there is something beyond the physical? 98% of the people said, we believe there's something beyond the physical. 2% said, we don't believe there's anything beyond physical. We think that's stupid. It's, you know, life is finite. It's over. It's over. It's over. Those 2% are always showing up to argue with the others, right? But they are such a minority. They are such a speck in, in the actual global society that my position has always been to completely ignore them and not to engage with them. Uh, if I find out they're in a class of mine, like in the early days, when I have a class of 500, there would be one or two of them sneak it into the class, trying to disrupt things in the class. I'd have them removed from the class. I'm not going to let poison like that be in the class. These are people right. without possibility, right, for themselves. So these people are about the 2%. There's nothing here. So let me just come in and cause problems. Uh, the next question asked, of the 98% was how many of you believe that if there's something beyond the physical, you can interact with it, that you can give to it, take from it, learn from it, right? Recognize it. How many of you believe that? 24% of that 98% said, we believe in something beyond the physical. And we believe that we can interact with it. In fact, we, we, we have interacted with it or words to that effect. The other 74% or 76% said, we believe there's something beyond the physical, but we don't believe that we will ever realize it or interact with it until we're, until we're gone, right? Till we die. That's, those are the, those are not agnostics. Those are believers, right? In there, they're believers. They believe So The truth is out of the all, all 3000 respondents, everybody believes something. Even the 2%, they can't prove that there is or there isn't. They just believe it. So that's how that stands. That gives clarity to me. In, 2000, uh, in 2019, the Pew Research Center did another similar study. But these respondents were global. Uh, and it, I, it was massive in terms of the number of data points collected. And the number from 2% in their perspective increased to something like 7%. So a disbelief in anything beyond the physical increased internationally to 7%. I'll explain more about that in a moment. <clears throat> the rest of it, uh, of the people who believe there's maybe something beyond the physical, but don't believe they'll inter ever interact with it. The Dutch actually came up with, an, with a word. Uh, called eats, uh, which is means uh, something. So I believe in something. That was the word described for that whole right uh, uh, demographic of people who believe there might there must be something. I don't know what it is, but I don't know that I'll ever be part of it. So the people that now stand squarely in the zone of I believe there's something beyond the physical. And I believe I can connect with it was now diminished down to 18. 18% of the global population believes that. So what went wrong? Uh, 20 years of war, uh, because as you understand, you, you know, you had the coming out of the 60s came what? Do you know? Remember the new age movement, right? Yep. Out of the flower children and all of the yogis and the other things, the new age movement began. That continued through the 70s. It, you know, it, it waned and gained and came through the 80s. And in the 90s, it started to swell. And why? Because the millennial change was coming. And all of them you know, were lined up waiting for the millennial change because this is where you heard people talking about the Mayan calendar, all this stuff and all these things are going to happen. People were wearing certain colors of clothes. I mean, I know I would be at the Omega Institute. I'd have 500 remote viewing students and I would have people turning their nose up at us because this they were learning a they were learning a military intelligence collection methodology but these people wearing you know certain kinds of sandals and you know certain kinds of robes these were not monks these were just people who thought that by wearing the color of that clothes it would put them in a pious you know position over others uh, and you just started seeing that more and more and more and of course the millennial comes the millennial transformation comes in 
not much of a transformation. It's just like calendar change, right? Right. And a year later, we're at war. And we are at war for a very long time. Now, just to give you an indication of what happened there, you know, back in the 80s and the, and the 90s, there were some 3,600, uh, you know, universities of spiritual learning, let's call them that, like the Omega Institute, Esalen, uh, Kirpala, I mean, the crossings and, and uh, uh, Austin, Texas, I mean, everywhere, right? And they were profitable. They had people coming and learning and Thich Nhat Hanh and John Kabat-Zinn and, you know, uh, Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra, you name it, they were all there. And then it was, there was me <laughs> talking about remote viewing, but there were <laughs> massive quantities of those things. Soon as 9-11, people stopped going there. Not all, but enough to take 3,600 of those institutions down to less than 300, less than 300 globally. And many of them just closed up shop. I know, uh, you know, I know Glenn Beck and his wife, who, who Glenn Beck was the original, uh, it was one of the, he was the first marketing director at Dell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when he retired, he took all of his stock options, cashed them in, came in, a multi, multi millionaire. He and his wife decided that they were going to build one of these spiritual training centers. It was going to have amazing spa. It was going to have, you know, amazing yoga stuff, a really powerful thing. And they put millions into the crossings in Austin, Texas. I mean, they would go out, camp on the site, meditate on the site. They wanted to make sure that the crossings, when it was constructed, you know, set softly on the site. That was what Ken told me, Ken and Joyce. And uh, they were amazing people. They created this most amazing place. If you ever look out at online crossings, Austin, Texas, um, I, you know, I was one of the first instructors that was there uh, and, and it just dwindled off into nothing. And it's now, it's like a, a, a rent conference rental place, right? It's, what do you think, what do you think caused all it? Just the let down after the, yeah, well, and then, there is a, what, but why would war, wouldn't war cause people to um, want to seek more spiritual guidance or is it, no, what's the no. logic behind it? it? See, something on that scale, uh, it's all about the energy again, right? And if you read Isaac Ben Salf and you understand, you know, this quantum mechanical perspective of these things, it goes into things that are like uh, into resonance, entrainment. It goes in concepts like uh, uh, constructive wave interference, destructive wave interference. interference. Uh, it, it carries with it on a global scale with affecting the global society, not just the soldiers and the firefights. But Is this related to like the four turnings? Yes, yeah, very much like that. We are, we have been in a, in a, uh, We've been in a fourth turning, which is the destructive phase of the global societal evolution. Strauss and Howard, the guys that you know graph that, put it together, but it's it's a concept that's been known, talked about since the beginning of time. Time, and as that goes, if you read the book, it goes that every what happens is we go through a destructive phase, a rebuilding phase, a sustainment phase, an unraveling phase, a destructive phase. This, that cycle can go anywhere from 85 to 150 years. It's a, these are fuzzy measurements of time, meaning that the global society affects how long a destructive phase lasts. It can be, it can be protracted or it can be contracted. Uh, we've already gone through quite a protracted, right? Quite a protracted one. Uh, and there is really no end in sight because now Afghanistan ends, but Ukraine begins. And that what's going on, especially today, is, I, I don't want to sound esoteric, but just from the physics perspective, it is real that there is a global societal resonance. Right. right. With cycles, you know, it's a way, yeah. a way resonance. You were talking like the language of waves, like, the frequency at which something vibrates. That is correct. And if you use Itzhak Bentov's model, we are all just raisins in jelly. And as one raisin vibrates more powerfully, 
than the other raisins, all of the other raisins in train to that powerful waveform. And there are very few ways in which for, you know, for you not to do that. It takes a great concerted effort of being responsible for yourself in the moment that allows you to do that. And cutting off environmental toxins, like I said to you, I don't watch the news. I don't want to watch it. You know, and I still I find out, you know, if a tsunami was heading my way, I'm sure that I would find out about it. If not, okay. But I've never in, since I stopped listening to it, uh, back in the uh, early- uh, I think the challenge though, is if you're not in tune or if you're less in tune with those resonances, if you kind of go your own way, life is harder. Like I felt that way myself where- <clears throat> I just see, you'll see this. It, I mean, it feels like a mass psychosis sometimes. And you're just looking at the data. And you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Why, you know? Well, no, I mean, I understand the perspective of what you're saying. I'm, I'm saying that um, in, in my environment, it, where I am, I, I don't want to be affected by false messaging. And I don't want right. to be by the packaging of news being thrown at me. If there's really something that I feel like I want to look at, I'll find it. Uh, and I'll look at it from, you know, not some blog or some news source. I'll, I'll find it from a peer-reviewed research. And, I, and I'm smart enough as a researcher to look backwards and say, who paid for this? So what's the real message here? Uh, it means a lot of reading uh, and a lot of listening to, you know, certain kinds of books that I want to listen to or read. Uh, but I'm not going to let television, you know, color my life and decide what my frequency is going to be, what my resonant frequency is going to be. I know that watching something like that changes my actual physiology. It really yeah. does. But it probably it, makes you angry. Mo, mo, like it does for most people, right? Of course. It's designed to do that. More so and more so every, you know, turn of the clock, they're looking, finding new ways to impact you visually auditorily, right? Informationally, they're trying to, you know, disrupt. And, and that more, unfortunately, in the human condition, uh, you know, it seems that the more disrupted we become, the more we become addicted to the disruption. And that is part of the whole entrainment of those kinds of things, what happens. And truly, you know, the, back to this thing, and if you're going to change that stuff, you have to be, have a way to disconnect from that. There's an individual uh, moment in which that's the only thing we're truly in charge of. Then there is a, you know, a, a rep, there's a moment of close friends that's where you are affiliate, you know, all of you are together and all of you are resonating in a certain way or not. There's a, there's a family moment, right? The, the collective family moment, the individuals coming together for that collective family moment, that entrainment. And each of us, if we are, the theory says that if we are able to resonate powerfully, taking care of us, understanding our purpose, understanding our primary question, understanding our calling, knowing that there is something beyond the physical, knowing that you have access to it and you can reach into it at any time you choose to reach into it. These things change human beings. It changes them. It really does. Remember, I said that when I was first brought into the unit, that Fern Gavin sat down and said to me that your life will never be the same. Mm -hmm. Brought my wife in at the time and said, excuse me from the room and said exactly the same thing to her after I got there. He said, your husband is not going to be the same man that you married, that you knew. What we do here is change his perspective on things, and it's going to change how he sees the world. It's going to change how he sees his relationship to you. Not always bad, and doesn't have to be bad, but I want you to understand as the spouse that these changes will occur, and if you support them and acknowledge them and, and are, work with them, there won't be problems. But I'm only bringing you in here and telling you this because Marriages fall apart in this place as this transformation takes place. They do. Most everyone in that, in that place had been divorced once or twice. I think Ed Dames, when he was there, was like six. He was his fourth, fourth marriage when he was there. Mel Riley, two marriages, like maybe three. Paul Smith, two, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> it, uh, it was an interesting thing to be 
have your wife told that it made for a very long, uh, difficult ride home because she was processing this. Like, what the hell does that be? Now, mm-hmm. what did you get yourself into? Because and she, you can't say what you're working on. So, you know, like yeah. for all she knows, her mind could go to like, uh, I don't know, like something, something actually worse than what, what you were doing. We, none of us there ever told our spouses what we were working on, but all of us told our spouses what we were doing. Uh, okay. What we were going to do. And you do change in that way. When you get to that place in the process where you're no longer quibbling with what's happening and what you're doing, and you see that the amount of data, the volume, and the accuracy of the data you're producing when you get your feedback, that's, there's a, there comes a point for me. It was like month in the month two, transitioning to month three. Um, the the slight switch went on in me. I mean, I, I just I just had a session where I I came out of it and I was like, oh my god, you know, like oh my god, I you know, I I just now you know I've had all these little evidences, but now it all codified and snapped together, and my brain and my reality altered in that moment. And the difficulty with, with it there uh, was because it was never, you know, researched in at SRI. It was never brought, in, you know, there were no manuals, right? So there was no manual for, well, what do you do when this transformation occurs? What do you say? I mean, do you tell them about something? Do you say that, you know, here's ways to moderate how you're feeling right now? Uh, be careful because uh, I'll tell you what it was in slang called. They called it the Messiah complex. Mm -hmm. Now guys that have been there for 10 or 15 years may not have remembered that, but they called it a Messiah complex. What it started to happen is if you didn't understand how to temper it, how to gauge it, how to use it and then not use it. Like if you just became this awakened and aware bull in a China closet, societal China closet, you just bulled over the over people all the time, and you started to think that you were wiser and more connected, and you know, these horrible things started to well up in you if you didn't catch them and stop them. And I don't want to say that you started to feel more pious than people, but you you began to feel like you just know more than people, and you know that you can't just blurt it out because they don't want to listen. So you you feel yourself rising above things and you look at people differently and not in condescending ways, but in ways of you don't now know what I know kind of a thing. That also is a bad thing for an army officer, especially, you know, when you go to your next uh, yeah, actual access program and worse than that, after you go through commander drill staff college and get a master masters in military art and science, right? Then you head to the 82nd airborne division and you're looking at people now because it's really once it, that door is open, once that portal is open, it uh, this connectedness it never closes again. You don't have enough in your lifetime to shut it off again, and that scares people, right? So now it's there, and you still really are not. You're still trying to figure out how to live your life like this because you see and hear things, and you seem to like look through the veneer of other people, and uh, which I know you can do intuitively and people can, but I wasn't. And now I was, uh, and so, I mean, I'm dealing with a two-star general who I think is, you know, Mike Steele, who I think is like an absolute arrogant ass. This was one of these generals who had no idea really what he really wanted from his staff. Mm-hmm. He only so he didn't spin. Want, saw it. Right. Yeah. So, he just kept them working, 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 not guidance, just critique. And I don't like people like that. And I don't care how many stars you have on your shoulder. And then in you the same start, way. Yeah. You start to see and hear things about him. Like, you know, this guy was out on range eight and he stepped in as a battalion commander and changed the, the, uh, the uh, scheme of maneuver for a platoon on a live fire that the company commander, the battalion, the company commander had approved. And the battalion command, you as a battalion commander, change it. And so, just 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 so the folks understand who are kind of non-military, when you're on a range like that, you're doing live fire. When you have a scheme of maneuver, you're rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. 
and rehearsing. And when somebody just comes in and just says, oh, no, change everything. OK, let's see the live fire. Right. That's basically what happened with this guy. Right. And uh, a young sergeant, you know, uh, stood up to help maneuver his squad and uh, an M60 machine gunner, you know, put a round right through his back now, because it was a it was the wrong scheme of maneuver. It was somebody coming in trying to play tactical expert who hadn't actually walked the range, but was looking out over the train and said, no, go this way and that way. And one of the things that support by fire positions have to do and or the other squads that are maneuvering, right? They always have to be cognizant, you know this, of like you're a tanker. So you know, you have to always know where the other tanks are. Uh, right. If you don't, and something pops up that looks like a tank, you could tear their, you know, take their turret off, right? Kill them. So it's the same thing in infantry in a, you know, in a, in a deliberate attack or contact movement to contact. These are all military terms that describe slightly different variations for which infantry will close with the infantry. I mean, close with the enemy. And so he kills this guy. Now, obviously this guy's connected. So there's a 15, six investigation, right? And he is exonerated, not his fault. They didn't do it the right way kind of a thing. You know, he provided good tactical guidance, but they didn't do it the right way. Well, here he is as a two-star general. And I already don't like this guy. And it's a, that's a bad thing for a major promotable to do. <laughs> to not like the two-star. Uh, it's career, career limiting. And uh, yeah, same range. I, well, how I find out about this is, the CG comes back, the, the, actu- the his aide goes straight to General, uh, Colonel Caravori, who is the chief of staff, and says, this just happened. And he told me not to say, you know, to say that he wasn't there, you know, or some words to that effect, to deny certain aspects of what just happened. That was the order from the two-star to, uh, to the captain that was his aide. Carvori launches into orbit as chief of staff. He too did not like this guy. And I find out from Carvori, he comes to me because I'm the training officer, which means that the range belongs to me, right? I'm the training division training officer. And he says, uh, range eight, that, that we just had a KIA at range eight, the training accident. Apparently this guy went to that same range from now Lieutenant Colonel to two star years later, does exactly the same thing and overrides a battalion a commander and a company commander and redirects a new scheme of maneuver. And sure enough, another, an, almost on the exact same spot, another sergeant stands up and a machine gun hits him right in the back, kills him, boom, dead, just like that. Well, obviously this guy who just got away with it as a lieutenant colonel is like backpedaling out of this thing and uh, ends up ends up escaping from this once again. But he didn't escape it from, you know, the, the awareness of people who knew what happened before and happened there. Uh, Caravori, Colonel Caravori got very vocal about it uh, to him, uh, as did I. And what ended up happening is when the opportunity provided itself, uh, when I, he, he was told I was writing this book, he used that as a way to, I don't know, deflect me by, you know, crushing me. Uh, but right. he also crushed Caravori. There was very few chiefs of staff of the 82nd Airborne Division that did not walk out of there and pin on the star. D- damn few, right? Uh, I don't know, 25% of them maybe. Well, Caravori, the efficiency report written by the guy, because Caravori got vocal, uh, ended his career. Carvory's career. So I could see that in this guy, among other things. I mean, I probably that's probably not a good piece for what we're talking about here. But well, uh, well, it ties into the fact that you're able to cut through kind of the fog of life and see this because I, I don't know if it's the same capability, right? I, it's just um, because of my ability to analyze data is just the way I would like I, I run in these sorts of things all the time. I feel like why, why is, why does nobody see this or there'll be, again, I'm not going to use 
they, they'd select someone for a position and the person was not qualified, had no idea what they were doing. It was obvious to me. And, you know, I would yeah, I'd carry them for, for some amount of time, but it would just kind of piss me off because, you know, they either make more money or have a higher position and they don't know what they're doing. And why don't people see through it? Well, I, I mean, I'm, what, the same reason, Sean, that this guy pinned on two stars, it certainly in my opinion, wasn't through his capable leadership. Uh, this guy was, this guy was truly a prima donna uh, jerk. I mean, he, Tony Tata, who was the, uh, who pinned on, I think Tony uh, re- retired as a major general, but Tony Tata, who was director of plans, uh, I mean, he and Brent, Brent Flanagan and I had coffee every day, every morning, until uh, I got in trouble, then they scattered, uh, you know, but Tony Tata said, told me that when the 82nd had plant, you were, were supposed to go to Haiti, right? Uh, and remember that was, that thing was in route and then Clinton called him back. And when President Clinton called them back, uh, Tata told me that, uh, that this general threw an absolute, like a fourth grader temper tantrum in the back of the aircraft like took his Kevlar off and threw it in the back and it bounced around in the back of the aircraft. The crew chief was like, what the hell are you doing? And, you know, stomped and swearing and carrying on like, cause you know, he wanted to be, he wanted to be the commander of the 82nd that invaded Haiti. And all of a sudden that big dream and all that was going to follow with that got chink, pull, the plug pulled. Uh, I, I think that those kinds of antics and his treatment of subordinates and other people who were, you know, his indifference to those kinds of things ended up uh, grossly shortening his career. He was put out to pasture after that. He became PACOM commander. Yeah. So a lot happened in there, you know. Uh, you well, that, now it's now it's actually I don't know, this. Oh yeah, the Indo Indo Pacific Indo Pac now or something. I can't remember, but I mean it's important now for sure, right? But yeah. back then probably not so much. No, yeah. but. You know, so be it. And, and I mean, I I saw him doing that. Like in, when was he there? He was, he was there. And he was a two star general in ninety five, and he was a three star at PACOM when I was there, like in two thousand five. Well, that's a big shift, not to you know, not to rise to the top. That meant you were just being cycled in different right. places, and you know. And and I, I had you know I, far be it for me to be able to know why you know, or what happened, but I'm just telling you as a as a former officer what I saw in this guy, uh, and I saw a lot of flaws, and that is not a good thing for a, a junior officer to be capable of doing. And I was not good at handling it, and I didn't have enough horsepower to be acting like that. And I will admit that I was foolish. You know, I, but I didn't understand how to control it. And I actually didn't understand why it was happening. And I sort of kind of thought that, you know, that that's the way I was supposed to act if I knew these kinds of things, which I know you struggle with because I thought I was doing the right thing. And I thought but deep inside, I knew I was, I was burning some things that it didn't need to be. Oh, well, so you were, you were doing the right thing, but the right thing has a cost. Sure. And in and, and 93, when I was sitting there at my desk as the division training officer, uh, I made the decision to write this book, Psychic Warrior. I actually called it Comes the Watcher. I hate that title, Psychic Warrior. That was what St. Martin's Press assigned to Right, because it, it's the marketing piece, and it sounds it, – it's like an instant uh, yeah. credibility knock, right? It is, isn't it? Because it's – People don't understand what, what I'm really talking about there. And right. the original manuscript was 740 pages long. And it was whittled down by uh, Sean, my, Sean Coyne, my uh, editor. Uh, he and his assistant whittled it down over like three or four weekends to 230, 238 or 235 pages. So I like thumbed through it. The, you know, the first time I looked at it, I was like, Jesus, man, this is not. You know, but they won't do that. A first time author, they're not going to publish 740 pages. They're just not going to do it. It was actually my second book, right? But they weren't going to do it because uh, 
My first book was a textbook, Non-Lethal Weapons, War Without Death. That's the thing that got me invited to the Mikhail Gorbachev State of the World uh, found a forum, rather. Uh, that was a trip uh, to be there as uh, an ousted you know, infantry officer with special ops background being there uh, presenting to, I mean, Brzezinski was in front of me like three feet away as I'm presenting, right? Uh, talking about alternative methods of conflict resolution as I outlined in the book. And uh, that was fun. I met the Dalai Lama there and other things who I never met, didn't even know who he was. Uh, you know, crazy story, right? Uh, it was a fun, that was a fun thing. And, but the psychic warrior got sculpted the way St. Martin's wanted to tell that story. And when I made that decision, I knew that there were going to be repercussions because I was, I was exposing a classified military intelligence collection program, which I had said that I would never do. And so you have, well, to, I mean, have uh, to be blunt, you could have gotten prison time for that. Like that was possible. Well, that was the yeah. intent. They were, that was their intention uh, to do that. Uh, that's a, the, you know, the backside of that story. I, uh, my, my guess is I, and I, uh, I don't mean to, to cut you off, but um my guess is part of the reason it went the way it went is by crushing you in, in putting you in prison. That's, that's basically saying, yes, this, this program is so effective and works so well that mm -hmm. we have to protect our secrets. So by uh, kind of the route they seem to have gone with the CIA, which is, is kind of minimizing and ridiculing and, and, you know, that may have led to, I guess, uh, lighter treatment, but I know there's more details and I'm glossing over it, but. Uh, it didn't feel light. <laughs> but, right. Uh, it, it, I knew that there would be blowback from this. I, I just knew there was. So I have to be very honest with the listeners. And why would I make that decision? I mean, I, I was, I was an officer that was, you know, headed for, good things as an officer. I had had an impeccable record up to that point. I had, you know, done things that were just never, that most officers at my age and my, you know, level of, had never done, you know, the special access programs I was in, the, you know, things I was privy to. I mean, I was, I was sent by the 82nd after I left the battalion. Uh, after I left the battalion, I was the XO in and then commanded it for a very short time. And I was, and I, I was sent to be the force comm commander's aide and so to interview for it. So I went to, uh, to Atlanta to be interviewed by the force comm commander to see if he wanted me as an aide. This would have been my third general if that had happened. And so he's a four star and, you know, he looks at me as a major and he looks at my thing. He looks at my folder. He goes back and forth, back and forth. He looks at me, he goes, Jesus, man. He goes, this is the most unusual career path of anybody that I have ever seen. And I, you, I know what do you say to that? I went, yes, sir. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, uh, but he didn't give me the job. He selected an aviator, which I was really happy that happened. To be honest with you, uh, I didn't want to be a four stars aide. So I, I ended up back to the eighty second, and then I become the division training officer, and things began to unfold in that way. But when I, when I was sitting there in ninety three, and I said I'm going to write this, uh, and I actually. How it happened is an interesting part of the history of this, right? Uh, I got a phone call one day uh, from Sandra Martin from Paraview uh, Press in from Paraview, the Par yeah, Paraview Press, Paraview, anyway, in, in New York City. And she said, look, we are working on this book with Jim Mars. Jim Mars is the guy who wrote Crossfire, the plot that killed Kennedy. And he's like the alien agenda guy, right? Alien Agenda, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I knew Jim Moore. I, I had met him. And uh, I met him several times. Actually, I had dinner with him twice. And, you know, talked to him a little bit about the, the unit and stuff like that. But he had married up with Ed Dames, who was out of the unit now, or out of the Army. He was retired. So he kind of became Ed's principal source. I mean, I was still a battalion XO or doing other things, which I was pretty busy. So I get this phone call from Sandra Martin that says, hey, can you come to New York City? Uh, we're having a problem with the book. 
uh, she goes, I don't want to talk about it over the phone, but I would like to see you in person. So I fly there. They pay to get me there. And I, I go into the offices of Fairview and they go, read this manuscript that Jim, Jim's given us and, and tell us what you think. So I read this manuscript and it is like, it's this fantasy thing that I know Jim Mars doesn't write because I read Crossfire. And so I'm, I'm looking at that and it had, it's all fantasy centered around Ed. Like, you know, this stuff, like, you know, so Ed Dames comes into the conference room and everybody stands at attention. What the, you know, are you kidding me? I mean, we wouldn't even have taken a sip of coffee. He didn't outrank anybody there. I mean, this was a remote viewing unit, right? So the whole book carried that kind of a tone. Well, at that point where it was, a couple cha few chapters in. And so I said, no, this is total fantasy. This won't work. And they went, we thought so. Yeah, that, that all can't be. So they canceled it. They just like outright said, we are not representing this book anymore, which that devastated Jim. And I think on some level, it connected a dot for him that I was the guy that did that. And I really wasn't. I just did what they asked me to do. Uh, and also for Ed Dames, he connected the dot that I was responsible for killing that book. And that is the point where friendship ended, you know, it was over. And I didn't, all I did was read it and go, it's not correct, it's not true. You know, these things didn't happen. Uh, and they just made that decision that they weren't gonna contend with that anymore. So they felt like he was lying. And, it, 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 and if what he said in that book is true, if he really said those things, he was lying. Uh, and so he had to wear that and it, and it canceled it. So it bruised, it bruised Ed's ego and it bruised, it hurt Jim Mars. And so I was asked, you know, weeks later, I was asked if I would write a, like an introductory chapter. So, and they said, make it not this stuff, just talk about what it was like for you showing up and going through this unit until you got spit out on the other side, what was that like? Just tell that story. So I wrote, I wrote two sample chapters. First time I'd ever in my life done that. Never considered myself a writer. Uh, never even considered myself really a storyteller. I was a special operations infantry officer. What kind of storyteller is that, right? So I wrote what I wrote and I sent it to them and they said, we want to contract you to write your story. And I agreed to do that. It didn't take, I swear to you, within five days, that information was across the intelligence community. Which leads me to my point is that in the print world and other media world, there are members of the agency. They are either employees of the CIA or they are individuals who for remuneration or something else feed information back to the CIA. So as soon as that idea was being tossed around on the wire, the phones and stuff, right? And an email, it, the, the elevation of what was going on around me started to intensify. Uh, <clears throat> and as you know, it, it ultimately got to the point where even at when the decision was made in 93 and then when the contract was signed in 94, now you started seeing these Washington Post articles and all this other stuff flying out. If you look at the timeline for that, it is the CIA who had already tried their damnedest to try to stop the book. And they tried to stop the book, desperately tried to stop the book. Uh, as soon as it was in the hands of St. Martin's, there were people that were getting galley, you know, getting copies of the galley prints that were then sending them out. And Paul Smith was part of, you know, writing a letter on there that said, this is his book. And, you know, here's his publishers, call them right away and, and tell them it's not true and try to stop it. That was what was going on. Guys, I used to think were at least good acquaintances or friends, or, you know, Paul was a member of the church. I mean, all these things started to happen. And I got feedback from Lynn Buchanan, who was heard one of the CIA guys talking uh, in a meeting. And they said, uh, Lynn tells me, he goes, one of the things the CIA said is, the weakness in Morehouse's philosophy is they thought he had friends. He has no friends in this. 
And that was damn true. That sure showed up. Uh, and the intensity. Well, if you're the CIA, if you're the CIA, your your mission is simple, right? You're yeah. you have a, you have a bunch of you have a bunch of people who worked in the remote viewing program, who the the wedge is obvious, which is this guy's going to make all the money that you guys could have made. So why are you supporting him, right? Easy wedge for the CIA okay. to exploit. Yeah, uh, and you know the the uh, dereliction of duty, wrongful disclosure of classified information was the tool handed to uh, to the commander of the 82nd. Right. We were, we were already like this, right? And so the sneaky part of that was that I was legally separated from my wife and had been for close to three years, I guess, you know, give or take a few months. And we specifically put into our separation agreement that we could not, we could not, what was the term? And it meant that we could see each other, the other people if we wanted to. And we could not, the term is molest. You cannot molest the other person for seeing somebody. It was personal, it was in there, right? And I thought, you know, all was good. And I actually dated a person, a, a woman who was uh, separated from her husband. And I dated her for like two months. Two and a half months. Yeah, CIA went right after that, guaranteed. It's a no, point of leverage, right? Absolutely. Credibility, trustworthiness. In the UCMJ manual, did you know that you can be legally separated? Mm -hmm. And if there is proof of intimacy, that you can be court-martialed for adultery. Did you know that? Yep. I didn't know that. I've been to Command Jail Staff College, our infantry officer advanced course. I've been there and I paid attention in the law classes. I mean, you're still technically, you're still, like, you're separated, but you're still technically married, right? You didn't have the divorce yet. No, but yeah. I had no idea. And anybody else I've ever talked to except you were all like, no, I had no idea. Yeah. In fact, the Lieutenant Colonel, when I was in the, the special access program, Torn Image, that Lieutenant Colonel, Art something, Art Spangler something, he, was the guy when he knew I was getting separated, uh, even before Command General Staff College, etc. He goes, it's got to look like this. Here's mine. <laughs> so he goes, have the lawyer make it like this, because then you'll be okay. And so that all that wording was in there for both my wife, my strange wife and I. And, uh, and she was a really good wife. She was a great army wife. The issue was me. You know, I had changed, you know, and I I was living alone and, uh, you know, with command drill staff college alone and did an MMAS alone and, you know, came back to the 82nd, was in the 82nd alone and you know, living in rented rooms and crap like that, just being focused on my job and the mission. And I have basically emotionally abandoned her. I mean, mm -hmm. to be very frank about it, uh, I ended up being a shitty husband and probably an even shittier father, to pardon my language. And I don't, I admit that in my, you know, in reflection of my life that that was, that was a regret, you know, to have done that. I'm an excellent, extraordinary friends with my son, who's the command sergeant major. I, I talked to one of my daughters talks to me and another one won't talk to me. Uh, but I understand that, that, you know, that is, that's the condition I created. So. Uh, so the CIA with this relationship, what did they do? Well, uh, you know, they drew up their that CIA didn't, but they they were of course pouring poison in the ear of the court martial authority, which was the guy, right, that didn't like me, and I didn't like him, and so what ended up happening is I get called up to the chief staff's office, and he goes, "Hey, man, they are going to prefer charges against you for adultery, and then everything they can think of that might fit in that, right, that might go in with adultery." Uh, which they have a bevy of things they can toss in there, which are frightening when you see them, because mm -hmm. you're thinking, God, if people think this is true, oh, you know, life is over. Uh, and I had a really good legal team. Uh, a, a guy I brought out of North Carolina it cost me forever because I just wasn't willing to trust my fate to an army major, you know, JAG officer. Right. And uh, he worked on the on the case, but well, he's got two masters, right? Yeah, exactly. 
So I had to have a, a private investigator and all this other stuff pull in this thing. And, you know, I was very confident in putting that part of this away. Basically, at this juncture, right? I'm a major promotable and I am, I'm, they're preferring court martial charges against me. And I kept saying, I, I didn't connect the dots on what was actually getting ready to happen. Uh, I was like all gung ho that this is going to, you know, this is going to unfold the right way. And finally, the legal team comes in and goes, you don't understand what's getting ready to happen. As soon as this court martial starts for adultery, that is when the floodgate opens for them to come in and throw down into the court martial, dereliction of duty, wrongful disclosure of classified information, count after count after count of count of everybody you talked to, everybody you told about this. And I guess, you know, there are probably some of the listeners that go, well, rightly so, you bastard. You violate a, secur a security oath, um, which is why I have to say why I did it. I yeah, did that's, it. That's, that's, that's actually the most natural question. That was like what spurred yeah. you, because it wasn't from your, my interaction with you, it wasn't the financial interest in doing it. There was something else, right? I mean, that, that, is, uh, that, was, that was insignificant to the to over, overall process. I, that meant absolutely nothing to me, and it never has meant anything to me. Um, you know, it, the reason I did it, it you know, stay with the story part where we were, I ended up resigning, uh, mm -hmm. and I ended up being given an other than honorable discharge, which years later, uh, a Marine female general who was in one of my classes, my remote viewing classes said to me, she goes, do you know, you can go back to the discharge review board and you can plead your case about this and you know, and, and give, give the evidence that was never given, because if you'd gone to the court martial, they would have preferred the, the charges of dereliction of duty. And they would have sent, they would have, she said, how would you have pled if that happened? I went guilty. I did it. I wouldn't stand. I would not sit on the stand over under oath and go, I did not do that. I don't know what you're right. talking about. I just wouldn't have done that. I'm not stupid. I, and I did it for a reason. So she goes, well, then you did the right thing. Because if you had gone and done that, they would have found a way to put you in jail. And they would have for a very long time. I mean, I'm not Chelsea Manning. I'm not going to get in there and get out very quickly because I you know, want to do something. I, there was a problem with that. I was going to go for a while. And they were going to make a big example of me. And the thing that was frustrating, and then I'll get back to the why. The thing that was extraordinarily frustrating for me is because of the things that I had done and the place that I had been and the connections that I had and the generals that, you know, said the things about me that they said, you know, destined to wear stars and, and even better comments. And I, I thought that they would come to my rescue. I thought that, you know, my accomplishments in the military uh, would be the buffer for this, that I might get my ass chewed or somebody might tell me because of what you've done, you won't get a battalion or something like that. But I'm at 18 years in my career at this point. And I end up having to resign and walk away. And, so you, uh, you're not even, you don't get retirement pay, nothing. I get nothing, nothing. And I've been given an other than honorable discharge. So I, as I said, I went back some years later because this female Marine general, uh, now retired, said, don't, don't stand for this. And so I went back. I had to hire a lawyer and went back. And you'll love this. I mean, there are five colonels. They are all what are called terminal colonels, meaning they're not going higher. <clears throat> and they sit on, the, on, a, on an elevated platform and uh, your case is presented to them, the case that got you the OTH. And there is a reader. The reader in my thing was a Mormon. <laughs> Which meant that the idea of being charged with adultery and the other stuff was something that was really lighting his personal fuse. I'm certain right. of this, uh, given his demeanor and the questions that he asked in the, in, the, in the meeting. And so in the board, rather. So the reader is responsible to read the entire file, which in my case was you know, 12 inches tall. And then he briefs the others. He prepares a small brief and gives it to the others. <clears throat> and so... I've got my son in uniform in there. I mean, there's an Air Force colonel in there. Vice President of Sony Music is in there. Uh, my wife is there uh, and you know, uh, my new wife. And I have 
185 letters that were written by former rangers and former lieutenants and others, uh, people that were that I served with, not people that actually that like, you know, fellow company commanders. There was always a competition with that, but soldiers that served under me and people who I had taught remote viewing over the years. So 185 letters, uh, at least, at least. 80% of those came from former Rangers and former paratroops that had served with me. And <clears throat> the board was faced with that. And, and then they asked, you know, they decided who was going to speak first. I think it was Patty. And as Patty started talking, she was so eloquent and she just immediately began weeping and her just talking about this, you know, what it was like to live with a man who felt like he had, you know, betrayed and lost something very valuable to him. And by the time she got done, there wasn't a dry eye in the room, you know, people of the people that were there on my behalf. Then the next person to present was my son. And by the time he gets done, and by the time Colonel Robert Frank, now deceased, the Air Force Colonel, three times below the zone to Air Force Colonel. There is, I'm looking up on the board, and the of the five people, four of them are wiping back tears. Just because the passion that these people were expressing to them, they were began resonating with it. <laughs> well, these, yeah, they began to see themselves in it for some, you know. Yeah. Oh. And then I get asked a question, and the instant I open my mouth to answer the question, I begin weeping myself. It was just the most crazy thing that I had ever experienced. And I ended up unanimously being given an honorable discharge. Unanimously. That normally never happens. And uh, even to get a reversal of a discharge of that nature, given the history, uh, would be, would have been less than 1%, easily less than 1%, according to my lawyer. He goes, you know, I, he goes, we'll find out. He goes, I, I have hopes, but he goes, the percentages are this. And uh, in less than five days, my lawyer calls me on the phone. He goes, am I talking to uh, the major promotable Morehouse with the honorable discharge? <laughs> and I, And the letter that accompanied it said, yeah, that the board found that the uh, the charges against me were baseless, without merit, and with no credible evidence. Uh, that's this, of course, was not the dereliction of duty because that was never a charge. It was the other crap. It was designed. I mean, is that not evil? It's designed to get you in there to think you're going to fight it, and then they're going to hit you with a thing that's going to, uh, you know, yeah, put you away for a long time. They're going to put you away. They're going to harpoon you in the back. Uh, so based on what was charged with, you know, what's basis <coughs> evidence. So now I walked out of there, a kind of a new guy, not dragging the baggage of an OTH out of there. Uh, and knowing my career, as you've seen it up to that point, you can imagine how devastating that was. And the things that were done to try to stop me as the messenger of all of this were, they were just gutting, frightening, you know, the things that they were willing to do to stop it. And to destroy me or to, you know, have my family die of carbon monoxide poisoning and, you know, and blame it on me in some way, right? And that happened. We had an ice storm in Maryland. I had a generator. I always pulled the generator out on the driveway uh, because there was one car in the driveway and one car in the street. I pulled the generator out on the driveway and I started to generate and runs the cable into the house. So we, power important things like the television, you know, and the refrigerator and the freezer. And uh, the whole family goes to sleep. And I'm kind of laying on the sofa watching some mindless program, uh, you know, petting the dog who's not getting up, which is odd. Senta, a German shepherd and a Siamese cat. The, Siam the family Siamese cat by the name of Ranger uh, gets up from where he was and starts to walk across the floor in front of me and wobbles and falls on his side and lets out this strange noise that I'd never heard before. So I stand up to see what's wrong with him. And I suddenly find my, I have no motor skills. I have no inability to like control what's happening. 
I stagger over to the door, which is closed, and open it and let fresh air come in. And I go out into the fresh, icy air. The whole place looks like a glazed, a glazed donut. I mean, everything, right? Trees, wires, houses, everything. And I just sit out there breathing and breathing until my head clears uh, after a few minutes, enough for me to go back in. And, and now I'm, I'm, I'm understand what's happening. And so I run upstairs, I get, I wake up you know, Debbie. I, then we both wake up the children because I said, you know, we're getting somebody's, you know, something's happening. There's carbon monoxide or something. So we start waking the kids up. Our two daughters are lethargic. The one that they, their rooms was over the, over the garage. And they were, they were, I really thought, that they were going to have to be resuscitated. So I pick them up. We carry them down. We carry them outside. I run back in and get coats. We get the whole family outside, including the dog and the cat. <clears throat> and I call 911. And uh, the police come. And the fire department comes. So the whole neighborhood wakes up, like at 2, 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. And the police say, is this you? And they're pointing at, because they've kept their bike, they're pointing at, footprints he goes something i go no that's not me i go i drug it out uh you know and drug it out and started it and closed the garage door and went back through the inner garage door and they're going well somebody on the street came off the street picked up the generator picked up the garage door apparently and pushed the generator in and closed the garage door back again he goes if you hadn't awakened when you did yeah. He said, we would have been here, you know, tomorrow sometime because you hadn't showed up for work or your wife hadn't. And we would have come in and found a whole house of corpses. And yeah, everybody would have said it was you putting the generator here. So they dusted and fingerprinted and went down through the whole thing, <laughs> cast the footprints, like all those kinds of things, but, and filed a police report for it. But yeah, no, they never found it. When did that happen? Was that before you published the book or? shortly thereafter it was uh during the time it was in had to be in like 95 ish 95 i can't recall exactly i could get a police report which i didn't call anyway but it uh yeah somewhere in that time frame there was a um, there was a concerted effort to actually stop the actual publication of it meaning it getting on the street or going where it was going to go and there was a certainly if I had, if they thought that I had committed suicide, given what else had happened or killed my family, right, they would have used that to discredit the messenger. That is what they would have done. Discredit and then the publishing company would have to pull the book or not launch the book. Discredit the book. Uh, and then there are other things that went on, these active things of sending stuff to, the, to people to call the publisher and do that stuff. It, this was really, really a bad deal of uh, watching people go out of their way to try to stop this thing. And, and then the CIA doing what they were doing, you know, and it releasing information that was minimal, distorted, right? All these things. And people sort of kind of believe that. And people need to understand that the Central Intelligence Agency, the acronym does not stand for the Central Information Agency. If they're saying anything to the American public, you better turn around and walk the other direction or certainly not believe what you're hearing because they're telling you what they want you to hear for a reason. They're not trying mm -hmm. to keep you informed. It's not their job. And if they're releasing documents and calling them FOIAs, right? They're releasing documents because they want to paint the picture that they want to paint. That's why those documents exist. They aren't putting them out there because they're, oh, we're just full disclosure now. There's never full disclosure with them, ever. It's never going to happen. They don't do that. And they are not obligated by a FOIA to disclose anything to you. They have a, there is a, all they have to do is come up with a simple sentence, not in the interest of national defense or not in, in, in the interest of, you know, national intelligence collection assets or exposure of this or something else. They can shut a FOIA down in a second. They're, they have no obligation to honor a FOIA. So when they release a FOIA, when they start dumping documents online for access to download, just have common sense enough to remember that 
who you're talking to and what you're dealing with. So back to 93, when I decided to do it. The yeah, reason, yeah. So why did you decide to release it? Yeah. <laughs> the reason I decided to do that was perhaps a flawed reason, but it was a purposeful reason. I had been changed through this. After decades of, uh, of being a believer of something, right? Uh, to almost to the level of feeling a hypocrite of something, uh, I, for the first time in my life, switched from believing something was beyond the physical to knowing something was part beyond the physical and knowing that I was part of that and knowing that I always have been. And going from believing to knowing is a powerful transition when it happens. And knowing means that you only know through the experience of doing in the physical and the non-physical. It very seldom just goes chink because you're standing in the sunlight somewhere. It is something that must be done to cross that threshold and coordinate remote viewing as a remote viewer there. And, and all the things I did as a follow-on in the remote viewing unit, those are the things that once the light came on, once the transformation occurred, then it just got reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And my in my brain, my analysis, my thoughts, my... My intention with all of that was simply, if this is what it is that I know it is, then this should not be sequestered away as an intelligence collection tool. How different would the global society be if everybody understood this, if everybody mm -hmm. made that transformation? And how different would the global society be if we started raising children with this understanding. The, theoretic, the theory is, or the mathematical model says, three generations. In fact, from, the, you know, from some other models, uh, say that one generation will change the ideology of the nation if you start with that one generation. Mathematically, to really hit that critical mass, I, you need three generations. But if you had three generations who were not being told this isn't real, or not being told that you can't talk about that because it's, you know, it's uh, juxtaposed to our religious beliefs or something else. It's not scientific because one of the 2% step in and go, you're a fool for thinking those things, right? right? How different would the global society be? Because you and I talked earlier and I said to you that, you know, re new research is being, uh, is being published that says this old, this old adage of, oh, we, we use 10% of our brain. And I said to you that there is now new research saying that you're actually, we actually use less than 1%. So if we're born into this life, it, assuming that research is accurate, it's even one to 10%, but assuming that research is accurate, and we know that everyone born healthy into this life has the neural capacity to learn to read, write, speak, understand any language on the planet ever before or presently while they're there. They have the neural capacity to do that. It's all about the environment of learning and how you feed that, right? There is no concept that they cannot understand if they are presented in the right way with the right tools and the right teachers. No concept. There's no physics. There's no, uh, you know, uh, there's no, <laughs> there's nothing in the engineering world, nothing in the physics world, nothing in the science world, nothing in, in music and in art or anything else that they cannot become. They have the neural capacity to be all those things. And there are no neural patterns that say, oh, this one will not be good at math, or this one will not understand you know, musical theory. It doesn't exist. But if they are not challenged and awakened and, and, and structured in that way, then by age 12, there is a Darwinian pruning that takes place. I don't mm -hmm. think they know how much is sloughed off, uh, but there is a sloughing of neural capacity. Still, even as adults, we are at the 1% to 10%. I'm going to go with a 1% for my, my, my thesis here. That this one less than 1%, you know, 1% we're born into this life with the capacity to live a life up to 68 years as I have now. And I'm not even using 1% of my brain, right? Why? What's yeah. missing that would give me the other, you know, 99%? Why am I not doing that? 
And if I was born into this life with this ability to be, to be connected with something outside the physical, to truly be and understand an omnipotent, omnipresent, right? Omniscient, uh, you know, eternal perspective on life. If you're gifted with those and born into this life with that, why, why was that? Why were we given that? We couldn't have been given that because it was just a mistake. If you want to give that, you know, that quality to God that created us, or if you want to call it a creator, or I don't care if it's, it's, you think it came, we came from an alien planet. It doesn't matter to me. None of that matters to, because it's not provable at this juncture. So all I know is we are an amazing, amazing uh, in capability. Something was born here. And how, what do we need to do to realize our true promise and possibility? What do we need to do? I just know that that's not going to happen. Me teaching adults in a classroom. All that can happen is me inspiring adults in a classroom to mm -hmm. turn around and look at the wee ones next to them and say, okay, check it out. We're going to do some new stuff and start working those kinds of programs in there. And there's lots of help out there now. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll give you one example. One of my one of my students who's also with me on uh, Clubhouse all the time as a moderator. She has taken her daughter. It was one of the things that I've seen. They, she videos these for me and sends them to me. And her she has this. She bought these squ plastic squares, mm -hmm. plastic squares. One's dark dark blue, the other is yellow. And there's like fifty of them, and it mixes them all up. So they got a hundred squares of different colors. Mixes them up in a bowl, puts them in front of her daughter. Her daughter puts a mindfold blindfold on. That's the best blindfold if you want one, by the way. And her job is to, there's two bowls sitting inside. She has to pull each of, pull plastic chips out one at a time and decide if it goes in the blue, blue bowl or the yellow bowl. And talking about modalities of perception, um, how her daughter does this with anywhere from 60 to 80% accuracy in doing that, is by taste. She tastes the plastic and is able to determine that's blue blueberry, that's lemon, that's blueberry, that's lemon, blueberry lemon. And that's how she does that. Now, <laughs> am I surprised by that? No, I am not surprised by it because it's a child recognizing a gift that every child has. Isn't that crazy? I think on that note, um, We'll probably we'll end this episode. We'll get into the next topic, which you also tantalizingly referred to, um, kind of this off-world historical record. So uh, join us on the next episode. Thank you again, Dr. Morehouse, and uh, we'll see you soon. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.